In this episode, we'll take a look at the Zoom Live Track L8 from a podcaster's perspective. Couple things first off, if you are a musician looking at the Live Track L8, what we're going to talk about here may or may not be that relevant to what you're trying to do, so you're dismissed. Also, this entire episode is recorded with the Zoom Live Track L8. We're using a Shure SM7B microphone, and we're going directly in to the Live Track L8. Let's talk about all the features and the pros on this piece of gear here. First of all, we have six microphone inputs. They're actually combo jacks, so you can put in XLR or quarter inch inputs. In the context of podcasting, you're almost always going to use XLR. Now, each of the inputs also has a dedicated gain dial. This is how much amplification of the microphone input signal it does to get your levels. And so you can see here we can go up to a 54. In fact, I'll push it here to 54. This is what it sounds like at 54. Now, all of this audio was recorded with this, and then in post, what we did is we normalized it to minus 23 LUFS, just so you can hear what it sounds like out of the recorder. We didn't do any sort of other processing, and I just wanted you to be able to hear what it sounded like. In addition to a dedicated gain or amplification dial for each of the inputs, there's a single switch that turns on phantom power for all six of the inputs. So, if you were going to use a microphone that's sensitive or doesn't accept any sort of phantom power, like a vintage ribbon microphone, you'll want to be really careful with that. Next up, of course, we have a few different buttons. The red button here right now means that it's armed, and that is meaning that it's recording. So right now we're recording input number one, and we're recording our master mix or stereo mix right here. Each input also has a fader, which defines how much of this microphone input signal is sent over here to the master mix. So you can see here as I reduce it here, it's not going into the master mix at all, but it's still recording to the isolated recording. So each microphone input is recorded to its own file, independent of the others. So you can do a lot of very careful post mixing if you wanted to have that workflow and do a really, really careful detailed mix that sounds great in the end. On the other hand, if you just want a quick turnaround and not a lot of post-processing, you can always just use the stereo mix here. I like that each of the inputs has a nine segment LED meter so you know exactly where your levels are at any time. And of course the master mix over here, the stereo mix if you will, also has the nine segment LED meter for both channels. In addition to the six microphone input, you also have a 3.5 millimeter TRRS input here. This is for feeding audio from your mobile phone into the LiveTrack L8. And it comes with the necessary cable here. You can see we have a 3.5 millimeter TRRS cable. Comes with that, which is nice, so you don't have to go searching around for one of those. Now, the nice thing about this is that not only can you feed audio from your phone, so for example, if you wanted to play some pre-recorded music that you had of your own making, or you wanted to Skype somebody and bring a remote host in onto your podcast, you can do that here. What's nice about it as well is that when the person that is on the phone talks to you, they'll be able to hear everybody that's being recorded locally to the Live Track L8. But when they talk, it has what's called a mix minus feature, which means it doesn't send their audio back to them. Now, the reason that's important that if it didn't have that feature, when they talked, they would get a feedback of their own voice. So it would kind of echo back to them. It would be really annoying and distracting. This takes care of that. Your remote caller does not get any sort of echo effect. So here we're going to do a little sample with the Zoom Live Track L8. And we have Danny here with us. Hi, how's it going? Great. Thanks for joining us today. So I'm over here on channel one. Danny's on channel two. You still there? Yes, I am here. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and um, you are uh, being mic'd by a, your, your microphone is an Electro Voice RE20. Hi, how's it going? Great. Okay. I think our levels are pretty decent there. And then I'm on a Shure SM7B. This is where our gain is set. We're close. Both of us are close to the top. Um, not 54 dB to and all the way, but probably in the 50 dB range right now, I would say. So that's what we have there. We do have some effects here on channel 7. Let's go ahead and play a couple of those. Okay, ready. Wow, those all sound like get the party started now. Yeah, exactly. So the party is started here, I'd say. 
We have this also set up here. You can see you can actually choose which input to use on, on these. So you can choose the pads. That's why these are lit up. So we can use these pads. I can't play these pads right now because we have this input set to take uh, an input from a mobile phone. So we have a 3.5 millimeter TRRS plug here. Hopefully this won't make any noise. Okay, there we go. So that's the tip ring ring sleeve. Plug that in here, here, like a tentacle sink. Oh. You connect that to your camera. If your camera has a time code input, and that was playing back from the phone. So let's go ahead and play a, a moment from the phone just so you can see here what that sounds like, just to get a sense for the sound quality coming in from the phone. The camera has a time code input, you connect it to that. If it doesn't have a time code input, you connect it to one of the audio inputs. Um, so you can also feed the audio to the... Okay, that gives us a sense for what that sounds like. We have our master fader over here. We can apply effects as well. The effects um, can be applied to the master or to the to the mix, the stereo mix over here. But you'll also get isolated recordings here for your, each of your individual microphones. So you can do a careful mix in post if you choose to do that. Let's go ahead and get a remote guest dialed up here. We're going to FaceTime uh, with Emma. Let's see how that goes. Hi. Hi. Hi, how's it going? Good, how are you? Good, thanks. Good. All right, so Emma's joined us here via FaceTime. Can you hear us okay? Yeah, can you hear me? Yeah. Um, do you hear any sort of echo? So when you talk to us, do you hear you echoing back? I know. It's just me. Just you. And you're just talking on your phone. You don't even have the headset on or anything, right? Right. Just you in your dorm room. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, tell us a little bit about what the exciting things you're working on right now. Exciting things I'm working on. <laughs> uh, well, about 30 minutes ago, I asked you about IP addresses. <laughs> uh -huh. and, and what was the context for that? The context of me asking about IP addresses, and I'm not a computer person, is that um, apparently to get tickets to good concerts, you got to not be on the same IP address, which I didn't know. <laughs> so... Do you mean you're going to have multiple computers or computing devices attempting to contact the ticket seller at the same time? That's right. Okay, got it. Got it. <laughs> All right. And um, tell us what the, what's in the lineup for this year at the university. What, uh, what courses are you taking? Um, I'm in theory, music theory two, and musicianship two. Um, so those are my like basic music classes, and then I also have trumpet studio as usual. Um, and then I'm also doing some gen ed, some anthropology and ethnic studies. Sounds good. How's the anthropology class? Oh, that's a fun one. It's online, so it's fairly lightweight, but it's interesting. Good. And it's a step further than what um, life sciences in high school would take you through. Or like a sociology or anthropology class. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Good. Yeah. Well, very good. Well, we would like to offer you our very best wishes on your efforts at purchasing the concert tickets you're after. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> fingers crossed. Yeah, fingers and toes. All right. Very good. Well, thanks for joining us today. We'll let you go. Okay, cool. Thank you. Nice to chat. Likewise. Yeah. Bye -bye. Have a good evening. Okay, good night. Good night. Good night. Next up, we also have these six sound pads. And what this allows you to do is play back various pre-recorded sounds. It comes with a variety of sounds. It might be useful. They're a little cheesy, but <laughs> they might be useful for your particular podcast. Or you can load the L8 with your own pre-recorded audio here. So that could be good for intro music, outro music, any sort of little jingles or stingers, whatever the case may be. You have four headphone jacks here, so four different people on the recording can listen in. Now, that's a little bit unusual because you have six inputs. So if you are using all six inputs and you want each person to have their own headphones, you will need a splitter or some sort of headphone controller for the last two people. The inbuilt recorder can record up to 12 channels. That's all six microphone input channels plus the 3.5 millimeter input or the pads, whichever one you're using. Now, when you do have a microphone plugged in here, that essentially takes this channel. So these three pads disappear. They're not available while you're working with the phone, but these three are available. And this is a stereo track, and this is a stereo track, and your master mix. So a total of 12 tracks 
you can record pretty much everything you need to. In addition, the recorder records at 44.1 kilohertz, 48 kilohertz, or 96 kilohertz, and at 16-bit or 24-bit wave file format. So you get a very high quality recording here. Now, one of the coolest things about the L8 is that you can power it via three different methods. First of all, on the bottom, there is a tray that allows you to insert four AA batteries. You can use alkaline batteries, nickel metal hydride rechargeable batteries, or lithium batteries. And you can also power via USB. And that gives you two new options. It gives you the ability to power via a USB battery bank like we're doing right now. And if you'd prefer, and you have AC power available, it does come with this adapter as well. So you plug in the USB cable here, and then plug into the wall here, and you have AC power. In addition, if you were to lose AC power while you were powering that way, and you had four AA batteries in, the power would switch over automatically to the four AA batteries, so you won't lose your recording. Now, powering time is going to depend on a few different factors. It depends on how many microphones you're recording, whether or not phantom power is on, and what sample rate you use. If you go to the higher sample rates, like 96, it's not going to power quite as long. But as a general rule of thumb, you can expect somewhere around an hour and a half to two hours on four AA alkaline batteries. You can expect somewhere around two and a half to three hours on nickel metal hydride batteries. And you can expect between maybe five and six hours on lithium batteries. Again, depending on how many inputs you're using phantom power and sample rate. The LiveTrack L8 can also act as an audio interface to your computer connecting via USB. So you connect this to your computer via USB, whether it's a Mac, PC, or an iPad, and you can then record directly to your computer. And at the same time that you're recording to your computer, you can also record on the SD card built into the LiveTrack L8 right back here. So you can record to both at the same time. That gives you some backup and redundancy. Another feature that's quite helpful is if you have multiple shows that you're doing, multiple podcasts, you can actually set up scenes for each of the different podcasts. And what that does is it basically saves all your settings so that when you go back to do that podcast again, you can just recall all the settings and get right back to where you were. So for example, here, I could say, let's save this setup right here to scene number one. And then when I needed to, I could come back over to scene number two for my other show, which maybe has three hosts and go ahead and set up those settings there. So I could switch back and forth very quickly and easily. Makes it a lot easier and quicker to get set up when you're starting a new show recording. Now there are two balanced XLR outputs, so you could also use the LiveTrack L8, not only as a recorder for your podcast, but if you were doing the show live, you could actually feed this out to a PA system, to cameras, or whatever you need to. Another thing that's very nice and is probably pretty obvious based on looking at it so far is that the Zoom L8 is set up basically like a traditional mixing board. So if you know how to use a mixing board, learning how to use this is going to be super simple. You also do have a three band equalizer and a low cut filter, which I think are really useful for podcasting. This is just to get rid of any rumble. Say for example, if you have the air conditioner or heater on, you can use that to help cut out some of that noise. And you can also fine tune the sound of all your microphones using the three channel equalizer for each independent input channel. Now, no product is perfect, including the L8. There are a few cons, let's talk about those. Now, this may be a little nitpicky, but it's not going to be a problem for most people, but the headphone outputs are really kind of designed for low impedance headphones. So if you have audiophile headphones that are rated at 250 ohms, these headphone outputs are gonna have a hard time powering those and actually getting a good strong signal out of them. So you're probably gonna to wanna to stick with headphones that have an impedance rating of somewhere around 60 ohms or lower. Another con is that the LiveTrack L8 does not have a variety of features that are found on some of the competitors. So for example, if we're talking about the Rodecaster Pro, what the Zoom LiveTrack L8 does not have is it does not have a compressor, it does not have a de -esser, it does not have a noise gate or an expander, it does not have an auto mix feature. So it's not necessarily a con, but it can be a little bit of a downside if you're doing live streaming where it's nice to be able to do that processing real time so that your audience gets a nice, good, strong, loud output level. And then finally, two other things relating to the build quality. First of all, number one, the USB cable that plugs into the bottom of the unit is a USB micro connector. And I'm not really sure why in 2020, or well, it was made in 2019, I guess, we're still using micro USB, but we are. For some people, that's really important. For me, it's, it's fine either way, I guess. <laughs> but some people are really particular about that. So just so you know, it's a micro USB. And then finally, the build quality here. The build quality is mostly plastic. You're going to have to take care of this if you're going to use it on a mobile basis. When you're transporting it, you'll want to protect it in some way. So you're probably going to want to get some sort of padded case for it. Um, I'm not sure how well it'll hold up on the long run. 
time will only tell, but it, I mean, it's decent, but it's not as robust, say, for example, as the Roadcaster Pro. Okay, done with the cons. Now, other things that are pretty nice about the unit here is that it is relatively small. So the dimensions are here. Weight-wise, it's 1.56 kilograms, 3.4 pounds. So it's pretty easy to move it around if you need to do that, if you're going to be recording a podcast on location somewhere. So that's great as well. Now, the one question I know we're going to get a lot of, and in fact, I've already got a lot of, is how does the LiveTrack L8 compare to the Rodecaster Pro for podcasting? And I think there's some pluses and minuses on both sides. It really depends on what you're trying to do. So there's not a clear answer, but let's run through some of the differences between them. First of all, price. The LiveTrack L8 comes in at $399 USD at the time of this review, whereas the Rodecaster Pro comes in at $599 US, difference of about $200. Now, the L8 is really more like a traditional mixer. And in fact, when I talked to my friend Will and had him look at both of them, he's not really a sound guy. I just had him look at both of them. And he basically said, My first impressions of the Zoom, um, it looks, it appears just visually like it can do a lot. It, it looks like from an audio engineer standpoint, that would be a tool that, you know, you would, you would see. Um, that they'd be working with. The road appeared more friendly for someone like myself that wanted to start out doing a podcast. It just look, it has that user-friendly look to me. And I think that's really true. I think that the Zoom L8 is a really great option if you want to kind of dive in and learn how a mixing board works and spend a little bit of time figuring out how all of this works. I think this is a great option. If that is in no way of interest to you at all, <laughs> and you really just want to get up and running right away, I think the Rodecaster might actually be a better option. For example, here you have an EQ, and you can use this to fine tune the voices of each of your participants in the podcast. On the Rodecaster Pro, basically what you do is you have a variety of different effects, and you can basically just turn them on or off and they're all keyed off of a very basic set of settings like how loud someone's voice is and what the tone of their voice is, whether it's low or high pitched. It, those are the only two settings. So for example, it does have a compressor, but you don't set the traditional compressor parameters or settings like ratio, attack, release, so on and so forth. So this works much more like the traditional audio gear works. The Rodecaster Pro does what everything it can basically to make it as simple as possible. And I think that's really one of the key differences between these two that helps most people decide which direction they want to go. Of course, the L8 has two additional inputs, so if you have more people, the L8 might make more sense. Both of them have four headphone outputs, but if you're working on the L8 and you do use all six of the inputs, you're going to have to come up with your own solution for getting additional headphone feeds for the last two people. So my feeling is everyone should have a headphone feed so that they can hear what's going on because a lot of people especially participants who aren't used to working with microphones they don't necessarily have the best microphone technique so they'll often look away and then their voice will drop off and things of that nature if you put headphones on them they'll start to realize oh i need to talk into the microphone because no one can hear me right now so that's a consideration let's talk about the self noise performance now i want to clarify something first of all what is self noise self noise is noise that's generated within the electronic circuitry of a recording device and that's going to be the entire signal chain. It'll be the microphone, it'll be the recorder, so on and so forth. One question a lot of people have asked is, well, if you're going to use a microphone like the Shure SM7B, do you need a mic activator, something like a cloud lifter or a FET head? This happens to be what's called a FET head. And what these do is they basically give your microphone some additional gain before they go into your recorder. You, you plug in the microphone here, and then you plug this end into the recorder. And... Let's take a look at that really quickly. I'm going to go ahead and put the FET head in. Now you saw, for example, here that we have the input set almost to the very top at 54 dB. And you can see here, we're not even getting out of the green area yet. <laughs> so let's go ahead and put the FET head in and see what happens. Okay, we're back. Okay, we are back here. And you can see now I have it set to probably 25 out of 54, roughly. Maybe a little bit higher than that, but we're getting uh, a signal that's even hotter now than it was before. So we could actually probably drop it down even just a little bit more. So that's what something like a mic activator will do for you. Is it strictly necessary for this case? I think where it's going to be helpful is if you're doing live streaming and you want to have a good, strong level right for the live stream. Now, if you're not going straight to a live stream 
and you're going to do some post processing, it's not a big deal. You can do that normal, what's called normalization or loudness normalization in post. But if you are live streaming, you're probably going to want something like a mic activator with a very gain hungry microphone like the Shure SM7B or a lot of the other dynamic microphones. So that is one thing to consider. And that's going to be true for both the Zoom Live Track L8 and the Rodecaster. And then I would say the final big difference between the two, the Rodecaster and the Live Track L8, is that the L8 has a lot more powering options. So if you need to be mobile, you have options there. With the Rodecaster, it's really built to be operated with AC power. It comes with a power adapter and that's it. There's no battery. There's no add-on product you can buy to power it via battery. You'd have to rig something yourself and it takes a 15 volt input. So that could be a little bit of work. Now for those that are DIYers, you could probably figure it out. But if you want something out of the box, it can be powered by battery via USB battery bank, AA batteries, or AC power. LH your choice. So I hope that was helpful for you in an overview of the Livetrack L8. If you have any questions, go ahead and leave those down below. And if you've not already subscribed, make sure you do that. And we'll be sure to get you more great videos on how to improve your lighting and sound for video. Talk to you soon.